Would you stand with us as we sing? I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Whenever I was living down in Blanco, we never we had we went through about four years of drought, and then finally we got some rain, and I mean it rained. It rained like it's doing here. We had a drought buster. The river came down three times in less than two weeks. That was big news back then. We had a guy that hadn't lived there very long. He came into the cafe and he said, Man, this rain is terrible. I'm tired of it. And one guy looked over at him and said, We never complain about the rain around here. And the guy said, okay, well, I just wish we had a little more sunshine. Okay. It is good to be together this morning. And if you're visiting with us, we're certainly glad that you've come to be with us. I want you to look at the end of the aisle on the left-hand side on the pew. I mean, if you would, go ahead and start our, our registration forms and pass those to your right. And they'll be picked up uh, after service. We want a record of your attendance. I, we usually don't have a whole lot of announcement. But this is one of our busiest times of the year. First off... I want to say thank you to everybody that came yes, yesterday morning and passed out the flyers for across the street for our neighbor to neighbor. Fantastic. They were done in less than, what, 245 or something like that? Well, I was just a little short. I've always been short, but 267 flyers passed out in 45 minutes. Doesn't take long. Now, what we need you to do is pray about this because what we're trying to do is to open the doors to our neighbors. Bring them to us. Let them get to know us, know that we're not going to bite their heads off or nail their feet to the floor or anything bad. We're going to try to be nice to them, and we want to be, and we're going to do that. Now, next Sunday, we're going to meet and pass those groceries out. That'll be from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. We're also going to be getting everything ready. You'll notice next Sunday up here, this whole stage, where's Beth? This whole stage, I'm stating it now, is going to be ready for VBS. I love it when we do that. I really do, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that, to see what they're going to do. Because next, we're building for Jesus in VBS, and I'm, I'm excited about that. And, and VBS is coming up Monday through Wednesday at 6.30 if you're, if you're on the team that's teaching and helping or a part of that family, we want you to be here. We'll start feeding uh, at 5 o'clock in the afternoons. So Sunday through Wednesday, if you're on the, on the working team, the teaching team, whatever you're doing, if you're helping in any way for VBS, we'll start feeding at 5 o'clock so that you don't have to worry about trying to rush somewhere and get to eat. You come and be a part, and we'll do that. Uh, we're going to have hamburgers on Sunday. We're going to have pizza on Monday, baked potatoes on Tuesday, and then everybody's invited to Wednesday night because we're not going to eat till after it's over we're going to, or till about 7 o'clock. We're going to have hot dogs for everybody. So come ready to prepare for that. Looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Mission printing is at 10 o'clock, not 10.30 as it's in the bulletin, so make that change as well. We don't normally do that, so <laughs> sorry about that. That take, took a little longer. But we are going to continue to do what we always do. Or not always, but traditionally we do. And that's to take just a few moments and to greet one another, prepare our minds for worship, 
Just stand where you are whenever we get to the next song because we're going to be standing anyway. Let's be putting, standing and putting on a smile. Let's greet one another and get ready for our worship this morning. Most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise, O oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true, great are you, Lord, most holy Lord.
As we come before you, Father, this morning, we are thankful that you are great and that your son Jesus is that firm foundation in our lives. Thank you, Father, for our time today in worshiping you in spirit and in truth, to sing these songs, to come to you in prayer, to remember Jesus on the cross for the remission of our sins through the communion feast and to hear a message from your word. We got many activities, Father, in the days ahead here at West Freeway, and we just pray, Father, that you'll bless every effort that comes forth. Bless this congregation as we reach out to our community with our food in a week. Bless our efforts with our Vacation Bible School, the workers that are already preparing for this time, for the teachers that will be teaching and the co-workers that will be helping them in every effort. And we pray that this community will see what is taking place here and will want to know more about you. We ask, Father, this morning that you'll continue to be with Hugh as he leads us in our song service. Bless Britt in the message that he has today and help us to listen attentively to what is being said. And we'll take this message and put it into our lives and share it with others and tell others about the saving Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask for your forgiveness at this time of our sins, and we ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. The reading this morning from 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12 in the NIV has to deal with living godly lives in a pagan society. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We're going to sing a song that's been around a long time, Faith of Our Fathers. But let's not make the mistake of thinking this is referring to the faith of my family. Uh, It's not my mother's faith or my granddad's faith. Although if you were brought up in a believing family, that is a great blessing. But this song refers to our going back to our early church fathers, to those who breathed or wrote down the God-breathed Word of God and left for us a legacy to follow, which we try our best to do, to follow God and be Christ followers according to the old faith. So let's sing this one together and remember how our faith came to us. Faith of our fathers
As we approach the table where we're going to commune together with the Lord and remember his death and his resurrection, with the great and unspeakable gift which he gave to us. Join us in taking this communion in remembrance of him as he commanded us until he comes again. When I survey Verse 19 says, He took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to them, saying, This is my body. Take it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather before you today, giving thanks to you for the complete and total sacrifice that you made in our behalf. Your, your body was broken, you were beaten and you suffered greatly. This we know that you did for us, and we worship you, and we pray in your most holy name. Amen. Amen.
In the very next verse, verse 20, it says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're here before you today, giving thanks again to you for the blood that you shed that covers our sins and give us the opportunity to be with you forever. We thank you, we love you, and we're so blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we have uh, completed our communion, we now enter into a, a part that is necessary for this church and all churches to go forward to spread God's word. And in 2 Corinthians, the ninth verse, chapter six, it says, remember this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and who gives generously will reap generously. And we know that God wants and loves a cheerful giver. So let's pray to him at this time. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us, and we know that giving is a necessary part of forwarding your word because of the need that everything costs so much and we just need to bring our church forward and use these funds to forward your word locally, nationwide, and worldwide. And for this reason, God has asked us to give generously. So at this time, we ask that we do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Sweet are the promises, kind is the word. Here upon the special gifts that they give, and then to remain here on the stage as Brother Britt gives them their special brief children's message before they go to uh, Bible times. So come on down, kiddos, as we sing you down here. I keep falling in love with him more. exciting is that I have the opportunity to talk to y'all for just a minute because I want to ask you a very important question. Who makes the rules at your house? You do? No, okay. <laughs> I thought he was just different. No, I know you do. Our parents, all right. Does mom make more than dad or does dad make more than mom? Your dad makes, your dad, dad. <laughs> Don't tell everything you know, okay? <laughs> the main thing I want y'all to listen, listen to me real carefully because this is the main thing I want y'all to understand. Did you know that all of these people out here have somebody that makes the rules for them too? We all do, don't we? Who? God does. That's right. And you know what? If we're, if we're in love with God, the way that we're in love with our parents, we don't mind following the rules, do we? And if we love our mom and dad, we don't mind following their rules either, do we? So that's the main thing we want to learn today is that if we love our moms and dads, we're going to follow the rules. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Y'all fold your hands. Let's bow together and let's pray. 
Father God, thank you so much for these young children and, and for what they mean to us, Father. Thank you for their parents, the love that they bestow upon them and, and, and shower them with, Father. I ask that you shower them with grace, shower them with obedience, and shower them with love. Help them to grow to be good Christian adults. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Over here. Woohoo! I swear that child is going to grow up and be a preacher. He's got the lungs for it. It's right there next to my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart. Oops. Oh, no. Good to see everybody. Glad you're here. You know, when we come, oops, I forgot something. I love our children. I really do. I love you, and it is good to be together this morning. But one of the things I want us to talk about this morning is something that I think we, we, we fail to touch on enough, and that is a, that we need to have a call for commitment. And I think it's important. In Exodus 3, in verses 1 through 15, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mount of, mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames from a, within a bush. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses, and Moses says, here I am. And God says, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place that where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parisiites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. How'd I do? Okay. And now the cry to the, of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that, is, that it is I who have sent you. And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the day. It's a special day because we're here together in your presence and we thank you for being here with us. For we are gathered, Father, to glorify you. And as we take a moment to think about your word and and our commitment to you, I pray, Father, that you'll open our hearts and our minds. Please, soften us, Father. Let us follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How committed are you? You say, well, committed to what? God. 
There's a lot of other things that we're committed to. We're committed to our jobs. We get up and we go. And we, we go when we're, we're sick. We go when we're not feeling well. We go when we don't really want to go. We go whenever it's tough. We go whenever it is that we don't feel like going because it's our job. So let me ask you a question. How do you feel about your spirituality? Stop a minute and take inventory. How do you feel spiritually right now in your relationship with God? How do you feel about the church family that meets here? Do you think that we're approaching being what God would have us be more than we have been in the past? Or less? These are haunting questions for a preacher, an elder, and should be for all of us. Because it speaks to our commitment to God. It's tough to admit sometimes that our religion is not primary in our lives. It's hard on us. We think about it. We think, I'm not worthy. And if we never confess that other things, if we never confess that, then other things crowd the throne of God in our hearts. And we fail to deal with it, but we need to deal with it. So why are we talking about casual Christianity and, and commitment in the first place? It's a good question. Casual Christianity is rampant throughout our land. It's a, always a, it's a man, let's, let's make ourselves feel good. Let's, let's, uh, let's just do, do what makes us feel more spiritual. The only problem is, is we need to change the word feel to be. Let's do what makes us and helps us to be more spiritual, not feel more spiritual. Last week, I introduced the idea of this because I asked you questions. What motivated you, first of all, to become a Christian, or two weeks ago anyway? And when you became a Christian, did you just make a decision about Jesus or did you make a commitment to him? What does the term commitment mean in the Bible? It means, sorry, missed that one. It means to make a commitment means to turn something over to someone. When you've made a commitment, how many, I'm not going to ask you, but how many of you have signed papers on buying something from some bank or institution? All of us have done that. Or if you haven't, you will. Or if you don't, well, God bless you. I'm thankful that you didn't have to do that. I really am. But most of us have to sign papers, and that is a signature when you put on there of commitment. I am going to fulfill my duty to you. Turn something over to someone. It implies committing to them, yielding to them, surrendering to them, or abandoning to them, even in our spiritual life, entrusting to them and placing it at their disposal. If husbands and wives made commitments like this instead of just decisions, divorce courts would be out of business. If parents would make this kind of commitment to discipline with children, our children would be better than they are. But guess what? That's what they could have said about my generation and the generation before me and the generation before that. We are all lacking in things that would make us better. So I'm, I, you know, somebody said, well, you're rehashing things from the past. Isn't, I believe that, it, it, wasn't it Solomon that said there's nothing new under the sun? I'm going to tell you something, folks. People have not changed. Times have changed. Situations have changed. But things haven't changed. People are still people. I mean, how would you rank your commitment right now? Where would it be in your life? I mean, there's no such thing as a partial commitment, and it's frightening to so many of us, and, and it is to me, to take that step of commitment and to turn loose of things in our lives. Instead, sometimes we draw a circle around us and tell God, this is as committed as I'm going to be. I'm not going to step outside that circle. We want to serve God within our own boundaries. Lord, I'll serve when it's easy driving distance from my parents. Or I'll serve in whatever way and at whatever time I find convenient. Because, see, 
the Bible is not a book for our convenience. We, we stay true to our commitment to follow Christ even when it's not convenient. It speaks about our commitment and our sacrifice. Going the second mile, leaving it all to follow Jesus. Boy, it makes it hard when you stop and think about it. I surrender all. I almost asked you to sing that song, and I stopped short because I thought, man, let's don't sing it and then feel bad about having sung it without asking the question, have I surrendered it all? Do we really sing what we say what we mean when we sing to God about that? The Bible talks about putting on the armor of a soldier and enduring the hardship of a soldier of Christ. Because, see, commitment is written across the pages from Genesis to Revelation. Commitment is climbing on the altar as the sacrificial lamb and saying, God, do with me what you desire. See, there's no reserve signs. There's no reserve signs. There's no keep out signs on our lives from God. You can't put those in your life and say, God, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you as long as you, don't, you, know, you don't, get, don't get involved. We like to tell our parents, what are you doing in my space? I like what one girl said, Mom, you're in my space. And she said, well, you were in my space for nine months. <laughs> Ooh, better stop and think about that one, huh? Who's the grown-up here? Sadly, sometimes it's not the adult. Sadly, sometimes it's the children that have to grow up and be the strong ones. So, young people, I'm talking to you too. Your commitment is going to mean just as much as your parents. So let me ask you, how are we doing? We're called a commitment. Taking our life to the next level. How are we doing with that? What are we doing? This morning, we're going to take a look at, 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 at taking a step further as we talk about the call to commitment. Because, and I want to use Moses here because I think Moses is a great example. If you look at this, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. Moses presents one of the most persuasive lessons concerning commitment to God. He is challenged to seemingly take on the impossible commitment in his life and one that he's not, he doesn't feel comfortable doing. But God directs Moses in a manner that applies to each and every one of us today. God is not satisfied with us being just Christians. He wants us to live under the Lordship of Christ. What did I ask our children this morning? Who makes the rules at your house? I loved Aiden's answer when I asked him who made the rules for his parents. God does. We're all there. Less, less, folks, listen very carefully. Less than total surrender is rebellion toward God. You can camouflage it, you can paint it, you can sophisticate it, but if you're not living under the Lordship of Christ, you are in open rebellion to God. Let me give you a little background on Moses. Moses was 40, year old, 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian for abusing the Hebrew slave. And right then he could have started a rebellion and releasing the redeemed of Israel. However, it wasn't God's plan to do that because Moses wasn't quite ready. Not quite ready. He wasn't anywhere close. He fled for his life to go to the backside of the desert and became a shepherd, a job despised by Egyptians. For some reason they hated sheep. And he settled in, in, in the land and he married the daughter of the priest of Midian. And it probably seemed like an ordinary day whenever God appeared to him in that bush. And I stop and I think, how has God spoken to us? Oh, it may not have been in a fiery bush. And yes, I believe that it was out of his words or out of the words of someone's mouth and heart of our children possibly. But one of the reasons we don't hear him is that we're caught up doing our own thing. Even whenever he tries to speak up, speak to us through situations that we don't always look at him as being involved in, we're in such a hurry that sometimes we pass right on by. But it's the message of the burning bush. God calls Moses to commit himself as a leader 
the salesman, the guide, the counselor, and the judge of Israel. I mean, can you imagine that responsibility? Rescuing a nation through whom the Messiah would come, your Savior. I mean, think about that impossible task. Leading nearly three million people through the desert. I'm surprised that the argument over food didn't come before the or shoes or water. Sleeping arrangements must have been really fun. The guy at the front went to bed at 8 o'clock and the guy in the back went to bed at midnight. And they all got up at the same time and started forward. So how do you know that? I don't. But think about 3 million people following one man, taking them to a land that was already inhabited by strong countries. And God said, don't worry about it, I'll give it to you. How could God expect anyone to do that? As God's people, we too have a big challenge before us. I'm thankful that we've got people who are willing to step out and do that. I was talking to Terry not too long ago. I'm really excited about what we're trying to do as far as reaching our, and there's ways that we could do this in other ways, but I asked Terry and he, he made a very important statement one time. I said, Terry, what good is this? little bag of food don't do anybody. He said, it gets us in the door. It gets us in the door. We fixed, a, what was it, 180 bags last time? And we gave away, what, 20? 20 bags. But everybody that came by got to know us. And everybody that got one of those little flyers that was hung on their door knew that we cared at least a little bit. We passed out how many yesterday? 267. There are 267 more families that know we care a little bit. Maybe not a whole lot yet. They may not realize that. What an impossible task. We're so often concerned, or so concerned, that we don't make a greater impact on our society, and we ask, well, why aren't we doing more? And it's because we're not committed to it. We're committed to this. Somebody says, well, what if it doesn't work? Hey, we'll do something different. But at least we're in the door. And if we're to be committed, we must respond to the Four urgent questions, the same ones that Moses faced. Number one, who is God? Who is he? We've got to respond to that. We've got to have that. Who is this God who is challenging you and me to live under him in submission to him and his divine authority, his rules? Who is this guy? And I want you to notice what Moses was told by God. He said, first, don't come any closer. He said, you, 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 you don't need to do that. But in verse 6, he introduces himself to Moses. And one of the reasons why more people aren't committed is that they don't know God. They know about him, but they don't know who he is. In verses 6 through 10, he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. He's watching. He's hurting because of these people and the problems that they're having. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land a land flowing with milk and honey. He introduces himself, he states the problem, and he comes up with a solution. And God called Moses, but notice what he says. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Uh-oh. Don't look in the mirror, folks. How many times have you said that? Uh, me? Uh, are you sure? I'm not sure I can do that. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I say to them? 
In other words, who do I blame this on if they don't want to follow me? Why is it so important for Moses to tell them who sent him? Because Moses doesn't think that they'll follow him. Many of us have lost track of who God is. He's not an old grandfather up in the air waiting on a day to maybe come back and get us, sleeping and napping as things go along. Folks, if we believe God is who God says he is, what right do we have to reserve any part of ourselves from him? Any part. If he is the God of the universe and you're God, how can we rebel against his authority in our lives? How can we expect our children to follow us and our rules if we're not willing to follow God and his? The second question we've got to ask is, who am I? Who am I? This is what Moses asked. Notice what he said in verse 12. He said, who am I? I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought out the people or brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. You and I will never serve God like we should until we know who we are individually. Do you know why so many people abuse themselves with drug and alcohol and immorality? They don't know who, who they are. They don't know whose they are. They don't know where they fit in. They have no connection with Christ. Oh, they may claim it, but they really don't have that connection. They don't know who God really is. They may claim they believe in God, but they have no connection with him because there's no commitment. And if you don't know where you fit in, let me share with you how you can get to that point. Number one, if you're to be committed, we must respond with four urgent questions. Who is God and who am I? You are a redeemed child of the living God. If you're a child of God, you are a disciple of Christ. And if you are a, uh, a Christian, you are the servant of the Most High God. And if you're a child of God, you're a soldier in God's army. And if you're a Christian, you are heaven bound. Wait a minute, what? Yeah, you've got heaven as a goal, as a home. Look at yourself in the mirror and say those things to yourself every morning this week. I'm a redeemed child of the living God. I am a disciple of Christ. I am a servant of the Most High God. I am a soldier in God's army. I'm going to heaven. Do you know why you don't have the right to just do your own thing? It's because of who you are. It's because of who he is. The third question is, is to whom do I belong? Moses made all kinds of excuses. Many of us make excuses. Who do you belong to? Well, let me ask you this. Do you have any excuses? God says there's no excuse. There is no excuse. What an insult to God. You try to give him an, an excuse for why you're not doing what you're doing. I want you to know something. He knows everything. So he never calls us for a task for which we're not suited and he knows what our talents are better than we do. I mean, who did Moses belong to? Who brought him into the world? Who spared his life as a baby? Who sent the daughter of Pharaoh out to the Nile to bathe at exactly the right time? Who caused her to love that Hebrew child? God did it. God did that. He saw to it that Moses grew up healthy and strong in the very house of Pharaoh. He equipped him, gifted him, blessed him, and made him ready for the call that he would issue. But Moses sounds like some of us when someone comes looking for workers, but I can't. Look what he says. And Moses said to the Lord, Oh, Lord, I, I'm not eloquent, neither therefore or heretofore, nor, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. I want you to notice what he says. But I'm slow of speech. And I'm slow of tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who bade your mouth? Or who makes you unable to speak, dumb or deaf, or the seeing or the blind? Have not I, the Lord, done it? 
Now, don't go running down Moses for his lack of faith because we imitate him every day of our lives. How often have we rationalized, given alibis, and reasoned when called on to perform some task that God has called us to do? And on our alibis, go and our loved ones die without Jesus. So I ask you this morning, who do you belong to? If you're a Christian, you don't belong to yourself. God is your final authority. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do you not know that your bodies, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with the price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Everything you have or ever hope to have already belongs to God. Your resources, your life, your time, your talents, your children, your wife, your spouse, your parents, your grandparents, all belong to God. So live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits. Folks, it's our purpose for being here this morning to glorify God, to thank him for what he's given us. That's what, that's what Hugh and I were talking about right before I got up here. Marvelous to be a part of this group. But what could possibly allow us to live our lives as we please when that in doing so is totally foreign to God's word? When God calls do what, do what he says. When God calls, do what he says. This morning, God asks you to surrender it all. Surrender everything to him. Lock, stock, and barrel, as my grandfather used to say. Keep nothing, nothing from him. Withhold absolutely no part of your life. Why not let go and let God have his way with you? Let it be true, as we often sing, he is my rock, he is my everything. And if your commitment or our commitment, mine included, if my commitment and your commitment ever catches up with our singing, I surrender all. He is my everything. I gave my life for thee. This morning, God calls you to be committed. So the question is, is how committed are you? Are you where you need to be? I don't know. See, that's the beauty of it. I want you to know something. I'm going to be totally honest with you this morning. I am not where I want to be in my spiritual walk with God. This sermon was very difficult for me to preach. Because every time I opened it up to look at it, I realized where all I'd failed and where I'm failing. So I want you this morning to pray for me. I'm not sure who has the, which elder has the prayer this morning. Who's got it? Jay, would you pray for me this morning? And I mean that sincerely. That I find my commitment level to be raised How are you doing? Are you ready? Are you as committed as you need to be? See, I don't know your heart. I know mine. I know I fail. I know I'm not perfect. I don't think that, you know, somebody says, well, are you in jeopardy of losing your soul? No, I've already asked for forgiveness all week. <laughs> About 60, 70 times this week. I've asked for strength, and I believe God's given it to me. I've asked for help, and I believe that God has provided it for me. I've asked for comfort, and I believe that God is giving it to me today. But I want you to know, I don't want to be on that road by myself. And if you're ready to march, there's people looking for God. Are you committed enough to God to do what he's asked us to do, to go and make disciples and be the kind of leaders that we need to be? And if you need to respond, do so now while we stand, while we sing.
Before I lead us in prayer, I want to remind all of those that are engaged or will be engaged in Vacation Bible School, those that have committed to do the various jobs, teaching and assisting in whatever way. Meet after services in the young adult room. Uh, we've got t-shirts that will be passed out to everyone and uh, some other comments to be made. So do remember that when we dismiss. Shall we bow in prayer? Our graceful, gracious Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for your son, for the life he lived here upon this earth, for the example he was for us. And we pray, Father, that it has been presented to us in the lesson this morning that we may commit our lives and make a purposeful commitment in our hearts to serve you, to follow your commands, to lead a life so that others can see that we are living for you. And Father, help us to be engaged in the work of the congregation here. Help us to be engaged in our families everywhere we go that we may show the light and the hope that is within us. We thank you, Father, for the lesson that Britt has presented to us this morning. And we ask that you also always give him and all of those that teach the abilities to express themselves in a way that we can understand. And as they try and attempt to teach us the word and to learn ways that we can apply this to our lives, help them and give Brit strength to continue to do that with enthusiasm as an example and to be engaged in all the lives that he is able to touch. Father, we also have a request this morning for Aaron and Jennifer Knight in the loss of their nephew who died in a car accident. We pray that you'd be with that family. Give them the strength to face the loss and help them to understand that, again, you're in control and that we just simply need to place our faith and our lives in your care and to engage our lives for you. We ask that you be with us as we leave this place and watch over us and protect us. Help us to arrive safely at our destinations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.